Hello and welcome to Tech for Non-Techies, the only podcast that demystifies the fast-growing technology sector. I'm your host, Sophia Madriega, Chicago Beef MBA and tech entrepreneur. My aim here is to give you the skills, knowledge and confidence to find opportunities in the tech sector, whether that's through founding a company, getting a dream job or bringing a fresh perspective to your work. Hello, smart people. So today we are going to do something a little bit different. Today I am going to invite you to the Tech for Non Techies book club. So the Tech for Non Techies book club is essentially a monthly review of a book that I found helpful in building my tech businesses and in my career. The premise is that I've read the books so you don't have to. So it's not quite like a normal book club. It can involve wine if you like though. So every month I get a book and I talk about the summary and how we can apply the lessons from the book to our businesses, our ventures, our careers and our goals. And these are available to Tech for Non-Techies members. So basically on the Tech for Non-Techies book club, if you turn up having read the book, then it's a better experience for you because you can actually participate and debate and essentially ask better questions. But if you haven't read the book and, you know, let's face it, you might not have the time or the energy to read the book on top of all the other stuff that you're doing, it's a good way for you to basically just spend an hour, learn the basics of something important and then get on with your day. In the book club, you get the masterclass and you also have learning notes to download. So I'm going to give you a shortened version of what we had in October. And our book for October was the very famous Walter Isaacson biography of Steve Jobs. The book is about 550 pages long, so it's quite a tome, but it's a biography. It's not a typical business book. So it reads like the story of an interesting man with the passions, the downfalls, the good sides and the dark sides of a brilliant creator. So if you haven't read the book and you're looking for something to read, definitely give this a go. There are business lessons, there are life lessons, and it's really well written. So the reason why I chose this book for Tech for Non-Techies is because Steve Jobs, in many ways, was a non-techie. And it's actually interesting because the book really contrasts Steve Jobs quite a lot with Bill Gates. And they are or I should say, sadly, they were very different people. Bill and Steve were both born in 1955, but they grew up to be very different people, although both grew up to be tech billionaires. Bill Gates was famously a developer who dropped out of Harvard to start Microsoft. Steve Jobs was also a college dropout, but from a completely different college, studying a completely different degree, and also for completely different reasons. Steve Jobs went to a liberal arts college And I was really surprised to find out just how much of a hippie he was. So actually in the first few sections of the book, it literally talks about the fact that he walked around dressed like a filthy hippie with dirty bare feet and that he smelt bad because he didn't believe in showering because he was in a fruitarian diet. I mean, this really does not sound like typical Silicon Valley largesse. So anyway, Steve Jobs goes to a liberal arts college where he is a hippie, taking a lot of acid and enjoying what California has to bring at that time. And Steve Jobs is really interested in Zen Buddhism and he's interested in art and he's interested in ideas. So he is not a developer. Bill Gates was studying computer science. Bill Gates has a very different way of looking at things. And so Microsoft, as a reflection of that, is a very different kind of company. Steve Jobs always admired artists. Artists, designers, creators were the people who really fascinated him. So here are some facts about Steve. As I said, he was born in 1955. He was given up for adoption by his birth parents. And then he was adopted by a couple who absolutely adored him. So his adoption story was actually a pretty happy one. As I mentioned, he went to a liberal arts college out of which he dropped out, not to start Apple, but because he wanted to explore the world. So again, very different from Bill Gates. So him and his best friend from high school, Steve Wozniak, 
co-found Apple in 1976. I'm not going to go into all of the events here because otherwise it would be here forever and there is the book and also the excellent Steve Jobs movie for that. But essentially the summary is Apple was co-founded in 1976. Then in 1985, he was fired from Apple. Yes, fired from the company he co-founded. So he created a company called Next, which made a very fancy, very beautiful computer, which nobody bought. So Next didn't do very well, although Apple did actually buy it. Then in 1986, he buys Pixar, which at the time was making technology for the movie industry. It was when he was at the helm that Pixar became the company that we know today. So basically the company that created Toy Story and Finding Nemo and all those other wonderful movies. In 1996, he comes back to Apple and he becomes a CEO. And then there's a huge wave of innovation again. And in 2006, so that's 10 years later, Disney acquires Pixar. So it does sound like he had this amazing string of successes, which he definitely did. But there were also failures, there were downfalls. And honestly, a lot of the failures and downfalls were his fault. So there was a lot of shooting himself in the foot. Steve Jobs revolutionized many industries, beginning with a personal computer in the 1980s. That then spread into revolutionizing the music industry with the iPod and then obviously telephones and more music and media in general with the iPhone, which created the app economy. And I think what's so interesting as well is that he created a company which lives beyond him. So Apple keeps on innovating, even though its iconic founder has been deceased for a while. You might have seen that Apple is actually coming out with its own search engine, which values privacy, which is basically contrary to Google. So this is a huge innovation that Apple is bringing out, which shows that the company that Steve Jobs created is capable of flourishing and being creative without him. So in the book club, we went through eight lessons from Steve Jobs. In the podcast, we're going to go through four. We just don't have the time to go through more. If you want to get the learning notes and all of the eight lessons, join Tech for Non-Techies and go to the book club and you'll get all of the previous recordings, including this one, and you'll get all the learning notes. The first lesson that Steve Jobs liked to emphasize himself was the mixture of art and technology, which is very unique. It was unique in Silicon Valley at the time, and it is unique today. He said, The reason Apple can create products like the iPad is that we've always tried to be at the intersection of technology and liberal arts. So this was not an engineering-driven organization. This was an organization where you had two different types of mindsets. So you had the technologists working together with the artists to make products that people love. Because at the end of the day, as I've mentioned on this podcast many times, If the code is fantastic and the engineering is amazing, but the product is ugly or nobody knows how to use it because the design is rubbish, then it just won't work. And this is where a lot of engineering companies were going wrong. So, for example, at the time, in the personal computing revolution, Dell was also making computers, but their computers were ugly and bulky and they looked like metal boxes. And yes, they had functionality, but it wasn't a product that you desired or that you were going to show off. And if we look at Apple today, I am proud of literally owning Apple products. They are beautiful. They are a point of envy. So again, art, desire, creativity, that is infused into Apple products along with the technology. This is why I think it's such a perfect example because this is exactly the kind of mentality that I want my students to have. Lesson two is about commercializing innovation. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that in Apple and in Pixar, Steve Jobs was not the person who made the product. Yes, he drove the vision, but he didn't make the thing. So, originally at Apple, it was his best friend and brilliant developer, Steve Wozniak, who is very sweet, just Google him. He is probably one of the nicest people in tech or probably in the world. 
So anyway, he's also very smart. Um, Steve Wozniak created a type of circuit board, basically something that goes inside a computer. And it was brilliant and people wanted to use it. And he was happily giving it away at engineering meetups in California. And Steve Jobs, his friend said, hang on a second, people want this thing and you're giving it away. Why don't we sell it? And literally, Steve Wozniak, he wasn't thinking that way. He was really happy to invent something that people wanted because he's an inventor. He's delighted when people use his inventions and when people want his inventions. It's a bit like, you know, if you cook something at home and then somebody asks you for a second helping, you are delighted. You're thinking, oh my God, they they really like something that I cooked. You're not necessarily thinking, oh, I made this really nice stew. People really like it. I'm going to open a stew restaurant. No. Steve Jobs had this commercial mindset of, okay, so you've got this good invention. Let's make it even more desirable. Let's make it commercial and let's sell it and let's make a company out of it. So this is what commercializing innovation is about. You see a raw product, you see raw innovation, and then you infuse it with art, human desire, and the profit motive, and you have a great company. It was actually a very similar story at Pixar. So Pixar is the animated movie company. Again, in this situation, Steve Jobs was not the one who was creating the software that gave us Toy Story. There was a gentleman called Lasseter. I forgot his first name, but his last name was Lasseter. So Lasseter was the genius inventor behind these stories and behind these characters. And it actually seems that there was some overlap in the characters of Lasseter and Wozniak. They loved making these products and they loved making these stories, but it was Steve Jobs who essentially created them into a company. So the lesson here is that if you're a non-technical person, which I'm assuming you are if you're listening to this, then learn skills and how you can commercialize innovations. Learn how to work with people who can be brilliant creators of an original technology or they can have the origin of an idea, but they need help to bring it to life. They need help to bring it to market. Yes, Steve Jobs is talked about as a visionary, which he definitely was. But one of the things that really struck me from the book is the partnership. So without Wozniak, without Lasseter, without Johnny Ive, who is a designer at Apple, these products wouldn't have existed or they wouldn't have been as brilliant. So actually, there's a lot of collaboration of Steve Jobs driving the vision and driving the teams and making people work really, really hard. But there were brilliant people to begin with and they had brilliant ideas to begin with. So the lesson here is learn how to bring products to market, learn about human desire and how to make products desirable, learn about how a company works and learn how to work with creative people because it is the co-creation of products that essentially created Apple and Pixar into the brilliant successes that they are today. Lesson three is that design comes first. In most tech companies, engineering dominates and designers literally just put the engineering into cases. So there will be a circuit board, there'll be essentially all the stuff that goes inside a computer, and then the designers will just put a box around it and then sell it to you as cheaply as possible. And that's exactly what Dell was doing. As I mentioned, Steve was really enthralled by artists. So of course he was going to put design at the top of the hierarchy. I should remember having this ridiculous conversation when I was in Silicon Valley last, So I was in a car with a developer who works at Apple and it was some kind of very fancy car. I forgot what it was, but some kind of very fancy, impressive car. And this man was telling me about essentially how terrible his life was because at Apple, the designers are gods and engineers are second class citizens. And he was kind of moping around and I was finding it very difficult to feel sorry for him as he was sitting there in his luxury convertible and you know and complaining about not being treated like a god at apple like these are some good problems to have 
What I think this shows is that this particular person who I was talking to had come from an engineering first company in Silicon Valley. So most tech companies are engineering first companies where the engineers are gods and everybody else is basically just there to commercialize what they're doing, put it into boxes, put it into designs and market it and sell it basically. So if you're coming from that environment where you as an engineer are the god and you go to Apple, you're going to have to adjust a little bit. And I'm not saying that design has to come first at every single company because it's not going to be right for every single company. But the reason why I'm telling you this is that I don't want you to have this idea that in every single technology company, there is this hierarchy of engineers and data scientists at the top and everybody else is just there to serve them as if they're kings. That is not the case. Just like there are lots of different personality types and there are lots of different people, Equally, there are different companies and there are different tech companies. Some tech companies can become extremely successful by valuing design over valuing technology or by valuing marketing over valuing technology. So this is why I think it's important for non-techies to understand these examples. At minimum, they will give you some confidence But hopefully they'll also inspire you to use your talents and get technology to enhance those talents so you can make your own inventions or boost your career prospects. Both are pretty good with me. The lead designer at Apple was called Johnny Ive. There's a really interesting interview in the Financial Times with him. Search for Lunch with EFT if you've got a Financial Times subscription and have a look at that interview. Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive were very close collaborators and... In the book, it says that Steve Jobs would go down to Johnny Ive's design studio every day to literally play with products and make changes that would have been invisible to most people. So there are good things and there are bad things to it. Sometimes Steve Jobs emphasized design too much at the detriment of other things. I mean, we all know the phrase, too much of a good thing. Kale is good for you, but if the only thing you eat is kale, then your body is not going to be very happy. So, for example, at Next, the company that Jobs founded when he was fired from Apple, there was such an emphasis on perfection in design that actually the computer itself wasn't really that usable because the engineering just didn't really work with it. Design is one of my favorite topics, and in my view... A lot of engineering talent is now becoming commoditized. And it's actually brilliant design that is coming to be more and more valued. What I mean by that is if you're making an app that's going to be used by consumers, or you're making a website, or you're making a content-serving algorithm, this stuff is not that difficult to make. It has been made by other people before. There's enough engineering talent out there for you to be able to hire teams at a relatively low cost to create these things. But as I mentioned before, if your code is perfect, but literally the users open your app and they don't know what the buttons do, or they swipe one way and actually something unexpected happens, and then you know they swipe around a couple of times, they don't get it and they give up, that's a design flaw. So The design is the thing that people see first. And if that doesn't work, it doesn't matter how great your code is. Because there's been so much emphasis on getting brilliant developers, non-technical people, non-technical founders especially, often ignore good design, good user experience design. And this is where things can fall apart. Engineers especially tend to undervalue design because they overvalue code. So my advice for non-technical professionals is to understand design as much as you can and don't worry so much about learning to code. Steve Jobs, for example, wasn't a brilliant coder. He did know some code. He could look at code. He absolutely could. But he really was completely obsessed with design. And he did pretty well. You don't need to take it to his level. But also for non-technical professionals, understanding design is going to be an easier hurdle to cross than learning to code. And then if you're going to learn to code, then which language? It's basically a never-ending piece of string. Okay, last lesson. Towards the end of his life, Steve Jobs reflected on 
his greatest inventions. And actually what he said was that his greatest invention was Apple the company. And this is from a man who had invented, or let's say co-invented, the personal computing industry, the iPod, the iPhone. I mean, there was a lot to go around. And he chose the company. Because as I emphasized before, all of these products, all of these innovations were co-created. And in order to co-create something wonderful, you need to have a team of brilliant, smart people who are motivated to deliver their best. And for those of you who have run companies or have led teams, you know how hard that is. Literally managing people, getting the best out of people, getting the best people, and also being a good boss to them. Those are the hardest things that I've had to do. I mean, I'm still learning and I have a long way to go. And what Steve Jobs was saying was that he wanted to create a company that was going to be able to be brilliant without him. Because if a company is only hanging on its founder, then it's only going to be brilliant as long as the founder remains brilliant. If the founder gets sick, which Steve Jobs did, if the founder is no longer around, which unfortunately Steve Jobs is not, or if the founder is just not interested anymore, then the company would fall apart. And is that a legacy? No, that is not a legacy. That is essentially almost like a freelancer just working with a great support team. Apple continues to innovate. They've invented the AirPods and now they're coming out with a new search engine. So Apple is still moving forward. It's one of the most valuable companies in the world and and working at Apple is still one of the most covetable jobs in the world. So again, for non-techies, what's the lesson here? The lesson here is that leading a team, creating a vision and getting brilliant people to do their best to fulfill that vision That's a really, really hard job. And that's not an engineering job. And that's not a data science job. So if you're a non-technical professional and you're having all these insecurities and you're thinking, oh my God, before I start a tech venture or before I even apply for a job in Facebook, I need to take a year-long coding course that's going to cost me thousands of dollars, don't. If you really want to learn to code, if that's your hobby, if that's what floats your boat, then go for it. But if it doesn't feel right, if it's boring to you, and if you're more attracted to the business side of things, you're more attracted to design, you're more attracted to marketing, then remember that a company is an invention. And it's all about co-creating rather than just being a lonely coder by yourself. I found the book super useful and very, very easy to read because it's written by somebody who writes biographies. So it's not a boring tech book. Honestly, if you're looking for something to read, then Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs is a pretty good choice. And the link is posted in the show notes. If you want to see the full Tech One on Techies book club version of this and get your learning notes, then sign up to Tech on Techies membership. You will get masterclasses every Tuesday. You get a whole library of content. You get a mini course on how to go from idea to live product. And you get access to our community and member meetups where you can get advice from me and meet your other Tech on Techies members. So basically, what is not to like? Next month, we are going to be reading a book on, guess what? Design. Because as I mentioned, design is often undervalued, and actually so important in technology. We are going to be reading a book called The Design of Everyday Things by design guru Don Norman. This was recommended to me by Tech on Techies guest, Sang Valt. You can listen to the episode with him, which was a few months ago. It's an introduction to user experience design. And The Design of Everyday Things, this book by Don Norman, is one of his favorite books. And what's interesting is that it was written about designing literally everyday things like, you know, kettles and glasses, not about designing apps. But I have heard about this book from so many designers of digital products that basically just emphasizes that human psychology is the same. You are still you, whether you're using an app or you're using a kettle. You're still going to get frustrated if the kettle is hard to pick up or if an app is incomprehensible. So read this book, come to the Tech for Non-Techies book club next month, and I'd love to know what you think about it. 
And if you haven't read the book, or if you haven't, or if you haven't finished all of it, then join the book club anyway, because you're going to get a summary and learning notes about it from me. On that note, thank you for listening. This has been wonderful. And final favor, if you have a friend who is interested in tech innovation and doesn't have a technical background, it would be just wonderful if you could send this podcast over to them. It would make you look really smart and very helpful, and it will be helpful to me. So it's basically a triple whammy of helpfulness. So think of one friend and send them this podcast. Thank you in advance. I'll speak to you next week. Have a fabulous day. Bye.